Hello, everybody. Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 586 New Social Environment. I'm Raven, the program's associate here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Eve Alabois, Robert Storr, Phyllis Tuckman, and Alex Bacon. We are thrilled to welcome po poet Bo Barrett White here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenape, Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions. The Brooklyn Rail would like to thank the Terra Foundation for sponsoring our NSC program and making these daily conversations possible and for their support for our growing archive. You can view today's event and our full archive on the Rail's YouTube channel. And now to introduce today's guests and hosts. A specialist in 20th century European American art, Eve Alabois is recognized for an recognized as an expert on a wide range of artists from Henry Matisse, Pablo Picasso, and Pete Mondrian and Barnett Newman. He is currently establishing the catalog of Ellsworth Kelly's paintings, relief, and sculptures. He has curated and co-curated a number of influential expert uh, exhibitions around the world. I'm sorry, and um, an oblique. Uh, Autobiography, a collection of essays is forthcoming at No Place Press in September. Robert Storr is the former Dean of Yale School of Art and senior curator in the Department of Painting and Sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art, New York. He has written numerous catalogs, articles, and books on major 20, 20th and 21st century artists. Critic and art historian and rail editor at large, Phyllis Tuckman teaches and writes about art, particularly sculpture. She's currently writing a book on the life and times of Robert Smithson. Curatorial associate at the Princeton University Art Museum. Alex Bacon is an art historian based in New York City who regularly writes criticism and organizes exhibitions of both contemporary and historical art. Bacon is a co-editor with Hal Foster of a collection of essays on Richard Hamilton as well as the author of texts in various exhibition catalogs and edited volumes. And now to pass it over to Alex. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Raven, for that introduction. And um, it's great to be here with such a distinguished group of panelists uh, to discuss these great sort of trio of exhibitions of Ellsworth Kelly's work um, at Matthew Marks Gallery and it's good, I think, to note right away that the shows close uh, this Saturday. So certainly run over uh, if you haven't seen them yet. And so just briefly, I wanted to contextualize. So um, it occurred to me that the exhibition sort of cover three uh, ways that Ellsworth Kelly has sort of approached uh, art and also space. And so I thought, that as the exhibitions do, that we would divide our um, focus in, into the wall, the floor, and the mail. And so we're going to have a brief introduction of each um, section, which is also thus an exhibition as well. And um, Phyllis Tuckman is going to take us through the wall, and then Eva Lan will take us down to the floor and I will lead us uh, through the mail system. Uh, so with that, um, I'm gonna hand it over to Phyllis. Thanks, Alex. Um, can we have the first slide of the red, blue, green, black, please? Perfect. Um, what I've written more or less was inspired by this uh, amazing uh, back wall at Matthew Marks Gallery on 24th Street. And um, this seems to be uh, a study um, for the big piece that was, uh, that's at the uh, uh, Dallas Symphony Hall. During the, past, the last 45 years, Ellsworth Kelly cited exceptional examples of public art in such far-flung places as Washington, D.C., Dallas, Boston, Berlin, Hanover, New Hampshire, and Austin. For more than two decades, he was actively redefining 
long held notions regarding the nature of murals. He replaced them with multi panel sequences of single color paintings and constructions. Because Kelly's art is abstract, it's tempting to compare it to music. That's a familiar trope. Some people might suggest his art is as, uh, is as expansive as a great symphony. Others might point to exquisite tone poems. Many might bring up Vasily Kandinsky's color theories regarding the spiritual in art. Then there's the faction that might view his art in terms of epic poetry. Or perhaps they might say he used blue, green, black, and red as if they were characters in a novel. Given the critical importance of shape, size, structure, and weather, yes, even weather, the particulars of Kelly's palette function as if they belong to a repertory company. Instead of Colonel Mustard, Professor Plum, Miss Scarlet, and Mr. Green, site-specific performances are enacted by blue, green, black, and red. Their different combinations have yielded infinite variation. Many years ago, Kelly told me, I'm interested in structure. I've always been interested in the structure of things and making something involved with that. I relate to the structure of things. I'm not a colorist. Color is on top of things. Can we go back and um, do the sequence of slides, please? So um, I, I, I don't exactly think this is a, a, an example of public art, though many of us have seen it in public in the Metropolitan Museum of Art for years. Um, I, love, I love the expression that, um, it's a creamsicle of colors. Uh, the work was made in 1969 and it's 49 feet long. Can I have the next please? This is uh, for the most part, I'm trying to show slides as if we're seeing them and not a professional photographer. So my apologies. This is the wall in the National Gallery of Art. Um, it's a stunning effect. The next, please. This is such a striking, complex uh, group of works in the Boston Federal Courthouse that is not um, accessible at this point to the public, sort of after 9-11. But um, there are these color panels and they are placed in many different spaces. Here's one, this well. The next one, please. Um, uh, I, I've seen it, but obviously I saw it long before uh, I owned an iPhone. The next, please. This gives you a sense of how tall um, the works in the Dallas uh, Symphony in the hall and the where the Dallas Symphony performs. The next, please. This is this should this should I hope everyone gets to go to Dartmouth to Hanover to see this work. Um, it's not not in the Hood Hood Museum but actually is on a wall um, facing the School of the Art. And it's just stunning. The next, please. And now um, here we're in Berlin 
we're in 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 a government building. Um, again, no access, but it is lit up at night and is quite stunning. Um, I took the photographs obviously in the daytime and with the cars and a bicycle coming up, you'll actually get a sense of the enormous scale. The next please. Oh, I guess not. Um, and here is the exterior of um, um, uh, the chapel-like building that, that Kelly designed for Austin. I think it should be on everybody's bucket list. There's no way to describe it. It has to be seen in person. Here you see two of the three wings. Um, there's a different geometric array on each of the three wings, the next. And it's a place you have to visit repeat, repeatedly and be aware of the different time of season, the different uh, time of day, because these colors just float on the floor and it's absolutely astonishing. So thank you, that's my little introduction. Thank you, Phyllis, for that. You've walked us through so many uh, sort of ideas and contexts for understanding these wall works that are on view at Matthew Marks right now. And I want to sort of almost go in order of some of the issues that you brought up. And, and one was the sort of way that you began by suggesting all these possible uh, ways that we might interpret uh, what at first might seem very sort of recalcitrant works and you brought up music, you brought up um, the human body, you brought up sort of narrative. Uh, and I wonder, maybe this is a way to bring um, uh, Robert Storr and, and Eva Lambois into this conversation and maybe to then ask about uh, what, what you think about uh, these different possible ways of reading these works, you know, what do you think about the different sort of uh, modalities that Phyllis has suggested, um, ranging again from mu music all the way to literature, uh, to the sort of human body? Is that an open invitation? It's an open invitation. Rob, why don't you start us off? Okay, I would start with this. I think the human body is always implicated in Ellsworth's work. And it's implicated differently according to the scale of the actual work itself, and whether it's a maquette or whether it's the full blown version. But you, you start with the Vitruvian human axis, verticals and horizontals. And that is where we see as much of what we see as we do through our eyes, our sense of balance or imbalance. And I think Ellsworth was a virtuoso in keying, triggering, whatever you want to call it, people's innate sense of balance and imbalance as a support. Mode. Sorry, I thought I'd turn my phone off, but I didn't. Um, of keying our innate sense of balance or imbalance as a support or as a background for the work that he's doing. Uh, and so I'm going to talk later about the, the piece that uh, um, even I want to talk about, which is the, the floor piece, which I think adds a whole new range of possibilities. But I would say the place to start with Ellsworth is with the body, maybe even before the eyes. But in any case, not to go to literature, not to go to analogies to other arts, uh, but just to deal as visually as one can with material that is as visual as it can get. Uh, Evelyn, do you want to jump in there in terms of your understanding of the way that, you know, the work, <clears throat> that we can relate to the work and sort of uh, motif? Well, I, I think that, you know, I agree with uh, what has been said, but I think that um, one of the, one of the importance of all the Ellsworth's uh, public uh, art is uh, is interest in scale. I mean, in principle, you know, when Ellsworth uh, makes uh, sketches for 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 anything, scale doesn't seem to be involved whatsoever. Uh, it's a shape. It's shape that is important. But of course, when you do something for for a specific space, scale become very important. And he had a way of judging the scale of of measuring the scale of something which i found extraordinary and in fact you you see that a lot in his 
postcards, he would just uh, make a little cutout of whatever shape he wanted to use in the public place. And and we and having sometimes a photograph, and he would just move the move the cutout. And so in some way, to to match what the way he wanted it to be, the size in which he wanted to have to, to be in reality on the photograph. And in a way, this is a kind of investment of his own body with regard to the scale. It was quite extraordinary, and uh, and he, he was a bit of ashamed of that. He, he he mentioned that in several interviews. He said, oh, "This silly, don't don't say it." But I thought it was extraordinary. This, uh, this kind of incorporation of the, the, the actual scale of the work through, through this, um, this movement. Um, and I think that leads to another sort of valence that uh, Phyllis brought up, which is that, of course, um, you know, in, the, in this exhibition, we're dealing with, um, you know, sort of paintings on the wall, which are either individual canvases, or in several cases, we have a sort of group of canvases, uh, sort of polyptic works. And uh, then Phyllis, of course, walked us through this wonderful survey of um, Ellsworth's public works. And then Eveline, you've also brought up the question of the public. And I wonder if maybe um, you guys could talk a bit about um, what is the sort of role, as you brought up, Eveline, this role of scale, and how does that change? You know, How does he address this, the sort of individual canvas that is maybe designed for gallery, museum, or you know, private sort of exhibition, um, and then this idea of the public, which of course we know he explored um, throughout his career uh, with all these numerous public commissions. Well, I think the first thing to say is that scale is what makes it public in certain ways, not a rhetoric. And um, you know he is not a muralist in the conventional way that that would have been understood in this country until about 1945-50. Uh, and he's not even a muralist in other respects either because he doesn't use the wall very much. He uses it as a foil for what he paints. Uh, whereas a true muralist builds you know, a, a complete space out of the painting which supplants the wall, so to speak. Um, there is the piece that he did for Philadelphia uh, which is the, um, I forget what it's called, but it's aluminum uh, uh, sections over a series of rods. And that that works almost as a mural, but it's really not a mural still because the, 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 the um, opacity or the uh, uh, immobility of the wall is only relatively perceived because what mostly you see are these different panels and their fluctuations optically in front of the wall. So I would say he's aware of that tradition. He certainly appreciated it, but he also used it as a pushing off point rather than a, a thing he wanted to follow up or uh, you know, in some ways re rejuvenate. Well, and this is uh, great that you bring up the wall because um, I wanted to talk about the role of the wall uh, in Ellsworth's work, which you have already started to speak about. And because I think this is one of his sort of unique contributions uh, is that he engages the wall and started to very early on in his career as a sort of active space, not as a sort of neutral container. He sort of intuited this idea of the sort of environment around the work um, at a time when the notion was still very much that the work was within the frame. And so I wonder if we could talk a bit more about and maybe Evelyn, you can start us off about the idea. You know, what is the wall uh, for Kelly? Is it a is it a support? Is it a vehicle? Um, what? How does the wall function uh, for these canvases or reliefs in some cases? Well, he, it's complicated to say because he had a somewhat ambivalent feeling about about this issue. On one hand, he considered the wall as a ground. Uh, and so it was. It would, re it would reintroduce the figure ground opposition to which, at some point, he, he, he had wanted or at, he had wanted to, to escape or to undo. Uh, but on the other hand, he, he also was careful to in every in all of his um, um, exhibitions. He was an extraordinary planner of exhibitions of his own exhibitions, like meticulous and and months in advance. He would to the millimeter because he planned. Uh, he realized he realized that even if works are not like like the one we have seen currently on the screen, this is, this is one work. But there are many many in his exhibitions. There were many 
uh, walls that were filled with, with paintings that are, that, that are autonomous, independent. But he was very, very careful how to what the way you would perceive the way the, the works would respond to each other and, and what, wall, what quantity of wall space each needed. That it was something that he was very, very obsessed with. So um, I think the wall changes function according to the, the, the use, the, if, it's a, if it's an exhibition, if it's a, a set piece made of components, if it's, you know, it, it, has, it has different parts. Uh, it has different way of, of uh, you know, it, it behaves differently for him. Um, but he was certainly always extraordinarily attentive to this uh, wall thing. And, and, you know, and very early on, I mean, his, his famous letter to John Cage in 1951, you know, he, he was really, our painting should be outside, it should be billboards and all that. So you, right from the start, it was uh, this dimension of public, public space and public scale was something important for him. And with regard to the sculpture that uh, Bob was mentioning, he, he, it was an extraordinary success um, in, at the time. It was in the cover architectural record and all this kind of thing. And he thought that, ah, finally, he had, by that time, he had sold almost nothing. One work in France, one work in America, nothing. He thought, ah, finally, I'm going to get those, those commissions. And he, he did get a few, but they were turned down. And so it's until, it, it, I think the first new public space was actually the Dallas one. Uh, you know, so we go from 1957 to 19, whatever it is, 89. So he wanted very much to do so, but it, it didn't work. It didn't, uh, it didn't click. Even though the piece in Philadelphia was vastly acclaimed at the time. And it, Mola now owns it, which is a great thing. But the pity of it is it doesn't have a space. Yeah, they don't even have to show yeah, it. Yes, it's the reason is, to, is to work with a given space, not just to make yeah. something that takes up space. Uh, oh, it's no. it's huge. I mean, when the Barnes showed it, it just the Barnes yeah. was more of a revelation than when the Museum of Modern Art opened. Uh, well, it's it has to do with also with the, the terrible lighting at MoMA. So when it was shown in the in the in the big uh, you know hall at, at MoMA, it looked it looked awful uh, because the, the shadow the, the the lighting is not. They can't change it. So the shadows of the rods were, were on the piece of aluminum and it looks absolutely abominable. So uh, um, I don't mm, please fill us. Um is my is my video broken? No, you're fine. Oh, okay, because I'm not showing up on the on the screen. Um I think the wall is 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 fascinating because the wall involves both paintings and relief sculptures. So that when I think of the wall, I also think of the sculpture garden at the MFA in Houston. I think of the sculpture garden in Seattle. I think of the little courtyard in the new building at the Chicago Art Institute. Um, and, 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 the, and, and how, how the work, like this black, this black piece in, um, at Matthew Marks, comes off the wall considerably versus the other ones. And, and it's just so, so fascinating how he plays with what hangs on the wall and how, you know, it's depth. And also that he paints the edges of the canvases, whether or not it's low relief or high relief, or he also exposes the, the steel, if it's a steel piece, the edge is a part of the thing. So that the wall is wall, and the painting is likewise matter of factual. But I, and I think these are all great contexts for this question of color, uh, because in a way the contribution to um, the monochrome of, of Kelly, what distinguishes him from some of the other approaches, for example, Eve Klein or Ad Reinhardt, as different as they are, are both sort of asking you to go into a sort of color experience within the canvas. Uh, solely. And then on the other extreme, you might have something like a Frank Stella, which has a sort of objectness, which maybe incorporates some space uh, necessarily, but not necessarily the entirety, the way that we've been talking about the wall sort of as a totality. And I can imagine the scale of wall. And I think you can see that in some of these public commissions that as the walls become quite large, so too does the work change in size and relationship 
And sometimes these proportions you can kind of see are related um, as the sort of size gets bigger, it's, it still retains a sort of scale that maybe is similar to how a uh, comparatively smaller uh, panel in a gallery wall might relate versus a sort of one of these panels on the outside of a building. And so this question of color uh, comes up and I, and of course is the subject of this uh, particular exhibition and this sort of focus that Kelly had um, on, at a certain point on these four colors. Um, but in the interest of time and, and keeping moving through all these shows, I think this is also a great way we are sort of stopping on this piece that touches the floor as well as hangs on the wall to move on to the floor. And I know Eva Lan has a yeah. slideshow for us. And I think Rob, it sounds like you also have a contribution. So perhaps we'll have Eva Lan go through his presentation and then Rob, you can uh, come in after that with your comments and then we can uh, okay. continue. Let me try to... Uh... What your console? This stops. Yeah. No, it's not this one. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I have to go to the. Uh, um, I, I can keep, like slideshow. Yeah. Is this it? Yeah. No. Oh, I have to go. It's just one. Oh, it's it's two more buttons over. Two more buttons over. Oh yeah, this one. Voila. There you go. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm going to speak about the the floor piece that uh, that um, is at the at the Matumark Gallery at the moment, but uh, just a little bit of history. Uh, um, Elsewhere made five of those. Um, <clears throat> Uh, four in the early uh, 90s and one uh, two decades later in, in 2011. So I'm going to show them very quickly with some of their, their, um, the sketches that went to them. This is the first one at Porticus in Frankfurt. And it was, then this, it's now being reinstalled in uh, um, uh, Glenstone. So we we'll give you some some photos, and I give you here yeah, the, the first on the corner. You have the first draft, the first idea, and he, he thought it would be green actually, but it was not going to touch. In his first idea, it was not touching the walls, and then it became you know he, he started to study with what it would do to touch the wall, and then the last the last study is the collage, and then you have the the construction uh, the diagram made by his assistant to be able to to build the. The, the floor, the, 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 wood the wood board on which the canvas would be, would be stretched. Um, this is the second one, which was in Berlin uh, in, in the Grosse Orangerie of Schloss Schaltenberg in 1991. And here you have uh, different, different sketches, including the, the final sketch that uh, Elsus gave to assistants to be able to, to do the, you know, the measured drawing to give to the fabricator in Germany. This is a famous one that is now at Matthew Marx, which I think is extraordinary. Um, and I don't have a lot of sketches of Elsus for this one, but we have um, you know, various, uh, various views. Um, there's another, and, and that's, that's the, the type of thing that his assistants do for the, to, to, to calculate how to cut the, the board, um, the wood, wood board. Um, then there's one at Leo Castelli in uh, 1990. 1992, which also commented upon um, later when he made um, this is a sketch, but he made a, he made a, a, a blue um, lit, lit, lithograph of the Castelli portfolio for Leo Castelli's 90, 90s birthday in 1997, and then the last one, which is um, in very very late, much later, 2011, in a black and white show at uh, uh, the Haus der Kunst in. In Munich, and in my mind, it works a little less well because it's it's a little too too uh, too small to, to my taste. Um, but um, what's interesting is that you realize here more clearly than uh, in the one in Porticus that the curve, the two curves here, are actually parts of a circle. Um, and the fact that we do not really perceive the geometric nature of the shapes, we 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 very very 
uh, often think that something is irregular when it is regular or, the, or vice versa. This is, some, it is an effect that, that Kelly had worked with and, and thought since the mid fifties. What is totally new, I think in these floor pieces is that it is due to the placement of the work, which are actually canvases, they are not sculpture on the floor. There are not many examples of paintings shown on the floor once they are done, of course Pollock painted on the floor, but there are not many examples of paintings which are put on the floor once they are finished, um, like a Roman mosaic, say. The only example that comes to my mind, and if anyone has more, more example, please pass it along, where it would be uh, Warhol's um, dance diagram, the way he showed them at his uh, 1965 exhibition in Philadelphia. Um, and of course, it was in a slightly ironic and even, you could say, aggressive mode, an invitation to the to the beholder to step in. Um, of course, the situation is very different when one thinks in terms of sculpture. The tradition of horizontal sculpture goes back to antiquity and is particularly strong in the Middle Ages with all these tomb sculptures uh, uh, discussed by Panofsky in his last book, which is his most formalist one, which is why it's my favorite one. Um, <clears throat> And, and of course, closer to us is Degas and there's Giacometti, uh, and of course, minimalism and so forth, the earth works and so forth. But it's important, I think, to underline that uh, Kelly's floor pieces are paintings. I would say that in some ways and intuitively, because he never had a theory, uh, uh, he responds to minimalism by pointing to something that he had repressed or considered taboo which is a possible relationship between the realm of painting and that of sculpture. In a way, he created, also created a kind of hybrid. Now, the sculpture of Elsworth, of Kelly, sorry, is, I cannot prevent myself from saying Elsworth, uh, because I've you know, interviewed him too much. Um, the, his sculpture is almost entirely frontal which is all the more surprising that in his two first self-standing sculptures in 1959, he explored both the frontal and the, the non-frontal, the anti-frontal mode. Uh, those are two works exactly made at exactly the same time for the same exhibition in 1959. And uh, the one on, on the, the red and, and, and the yellow one, Pony, is actually um, became the first of his rockers, as he called them. Uh, <clears throat> and he, it's a shape that he was tempted to uh, to look into periodically. So the, the blue and, and red uh, rocker dates from 1963, the green rocker from 1968. But it's, it's not something that he, he paid a lot of attention until much later. But what's interesting is that when he photographed the green rocker while it was being made, he made all these photographs from different points of view, which is really unlike most of the, what you would associate with Elsa Skelly's culture, which is, as I say, always very frontal. So he, he got much more interested again in, the, in these workers later on in the 80s. He made about seven of them, all based on these different, different types of folding, sometimes symmetrical, sometimes asymmetrical. Um, what I find interesting is that with the exception of the rockers, the exploration of non-frontality in his work came from his interest on the perspectival deformation of shapes seen on the ground. And that, that happens, I think, with these is this famous four, four angles, two uh, are, are paintings and two are sculptures um, that date from 65, 66. Um, the works are both works are frontal, but they but the half that is on the floor gets shortened. Uh, the rectangle becomes visually becomes a trapeze. Elsworth had long been fascinated by flattening, flattened perception of perspectival uh, foreshortening in the daily life. That's a topic, uh, for example, of photography that he, he took in 1970. But it is only in 1973 that he got to it in his own work, this time abandoning any frontality with his great curve of great curve one, um, <clears throat> which is you know, placed on, on the floor, the first of his large weathering steel sculptures. And in this particular case, painting based on the same shape, but placed on the wall, were created long after the sculpture, 1986, 19, 87 and 1997. 
as if Kelly wanted to check how different the shape would look seen horizontally and vertically. In any event, I, I think that this idea of the sculptural life of painting when placed on the floor was very, very much in his mind when he made his formidable gigantic floor panels of which the most, one of the most spectacular is the red one, which is currently at Matthew Marx. To conclude, let me correct something I said earlier, which is that photographs can, can't really ca capture the effect of this work, of these floor panels. Actually, there is something that it can, I think, at least to some extent, which is that the, the shape at some point, which varies with the light and other external factors, seems to tilt in shape, in space, pardon, sorry. You forget it's on the floor and it suddenly appears as a vertical shape. At least it has been my experience, almost a hallucinatory one, especially when such works are shown in a wide cube as it is uh, in the case, the case today for the red piece. This tilting in space almost has a feeling that the, the panel recedes in depth, the vertical panel recedes in depth, is something that Kelly started to explore in 1968. For example, with red green, which is made of two joint panel. But it really took off in a, mon in a monochrome shaped canvas of the late 70s and early 80s. That is, that, that's why he really started to explore this idea of tilting. And here's, for example, the blue panel of 1977, the red panel of 1980, but also the green panel, which is also at the show of Matthew Marx, not, not in the same show as the, the same gallery as the, the red floor, but on, on 24th Street. So uh, this is what I want to say. Wow. Thank you. I, maybe I'll just jump in quickly before we turn it over to Rob. This, this question of painting on the floor, and um, it made me think, well, first of all, Harry Cooper has jumped in with the interesting a uh, suggestion of Linda Banglis's pourings as a sort of floor painting. And I think that's certainly one sort of expand, let's call the sort of expanded field of uh, painting, which might hit the floor. We could include maybe Richard Serra's splash pieces in that kind of uh, genealogy. But I also thought of um, certainly of support surface, which Kelly anticipates the sort of like Louis Kahn sort of working between wall and floor is a sort of very particular way of engaging uh, with the floor, which is not the same as this. Uh, and also uh, Pino Galizio sort of covering space with these rolls of painted canvas, which again, I think, you know, all of these are sort of expanded fields of painting, whereas these particular works of Kelly's really sort of rely on the painted canvas in a way that feels almost anachronistic given this sort of history, uh, long history you mentioned, Evelyn, of floor sculpture. And um, though I think when you started to talk about the optical effects of how shape changes when we perceive it on the floor and we move around uh, these works and the way that they sort of block space also and the way that you showed that he in a way obviously wanted that right like when he has the first idea and then he moves it out to the edge of the room so as to kind of actively um, force us to see only parts of of the work and not sort of circumnavigate it the way that say a Carl Andre we can not only circumnavigate but also cross and be on top of and so uh, again that sort of idea of painting as something separate um, is maintained and again, these different views really show that sort of optical uh, play that uh, must have been how he selected these shapes. So that even though we don't really perceive, as you said, the shapes uh, themselves, and we can only really see them in those plans, uh, nonetheless, they, they sort of engage us in that optical play. And no doubt they were chosen because of how they do that. Um, and with that, uh, Rob, would you like to jump in with uh, your thoughts on this body of work? Well, where, where you left it is a good place to jump in because uh, the principal thing I wanted to say is that Ellsworth was, in my experience of his work, in my experience of him, uh, an empiricist. He had no a priori theory. He had no uh, destination. He had no mission to accomplish. He was deeply, deeply interested in visual phenomena, and he engendered visual phenomena that kept him interested. Now, one of the ways to do that is to create built-in imbalances. 
And one of the, I guess, exceptions that he took to early modernism, which tended towards symmetry, although if you look at Mondrian, obviously he kicked it around a good deal. But if you if you take those as precedents, he wanted to in sort of bring people as close to fulfilling their desire for symmetry as possible and then deny it to them, or to do something that would create a flutter in their mental image as they tried to match it up with their actual physiological you know, experiential image. And I think that's that's the, the territory he played in between the eidetic image and the and the actual thing in front of you. And um, I've always found that, that, that Rudolf Reinheim's book on art and visual perception is very helpful in looking at Kelly's work because that's the, ter the territory that, that um, Reinheim was involved in. It's about what is a gestalt? A gestalt is a memorable ex visual experience and the minute that memorable visual experience starts to wobble, the minute the holism of that experience is called into question, there's a higher level of active engagement of the viewer. And Kelly took every possible viewer, average viewers, sophisticated viewers, back to that place over and over and over again with incredible ingenuity, I guess you'd have to say. Uh, and I would just like to put at the end of that that uh, Ellsworth Art does not require you to subscribe to any ideology to any definition of quality, to any anything before you see it. You see it and then he's got you. And I think in that way, he stands out among most of his contemporaries because he's not pushing an idea. He is offering an experience and that is a very generous democratic thing to do. Um, before we move on to the mail, uh, Phyllis, do you have any comments you'd like to add about this body of work? No, I'm, Maybe just about enjoying, the I'm just enjoying the conversation. Well, great. Um, well, in the interest of keeping it moving, and, and we had so many ideas in that, which I hope we can continue to pick up on, uh, let us touch now on the final presentation of work, which is uh, in a certain way, a quite different body of work, a very personal body of work, and one that spans, um, a large portion of the artist's career. Um, and, and Kelly made uh, these sort of collage postcards between 1954 and 2005, and the exhibition ranges across that period. And um, this is a sort of personal body of work, which in his lifetime was uh, not sold and uh, sort of only very rarely exhibited and, and certainly not until later in his career. And they offer a sort of very personal and intimate view into how he sees the world. And this is something that we actually haven't touched on much yet, uh, but which is a sort of important aspect of the work, which is of course that, um, as Evelyn has said of, of the paintings that, um, Kelly was always drawn to the already found. And so this idea that, uh, as you were maybe alluding to Rob just now, that unlike um, other artists who work with geometry and the monochrome and, and these other strategies like chance and the grid, um, Kelly did not invent um, or theorize uh, his motifs, but rather always found them in the world and was a sort of avid looker mm -hmm. and experiencer of the world. And I think this is very much what uh, these postcards sort of reveal. And um, what they are sort of typify them is that you have this sort of found element, as with so much of his work, of the landscape in the postcard. And so, um, Patricia Pike has suggested that um, these sort of suited Kelly because he did not have to go and frame, you know, the world uh, with his camera. He could select these framings that already existed uh, in the eyes of these sort of anonymous sort of commercial postcard photography. And then within the space of that, he could insert a variety of different collage strategies. And of course, we know that he was an avid um, appreciator of the sort of uh, historical avant-garde, and he would have been familiar with the work of Duchamp or Schwitters or Max Ernst, and also, of course, met um, Hans Arp and saw 
um, which were very influential to him, those sort of early chance-based collages, um, that ARP and his wife's uh, Sophie Teuber ARP uh, produced already in the late 19 teens. And um, so in a way, there's a range of strategies that we can find in these postcards and they range um, from works that are like this one, which is just because it's come on the screen, this sort of humorous sort of play with, again, these elements which we might consider uh, removed from the sort of paintings, but this idea of the sort of found form and shape of uh, the human body even. And these range from sort of humorous to in some even sort of more erotic or suggestive um, elements. And I think we can also see that even with works that are not of bodies. And also there's elements in which he's recycling his own work, for example, in 64, he's producing his first um, graphic editions uh, and he cuts up some of these and collages them. And also in a way to cycle back to uh, how Phyllis began us in these conversations with the idea of the public, some early ideas of sort of public sculpture, uh, you could argue were uh, sort of ventured in, in some, some of these postcards where you find uh, some of these works um, are a bit more formal, as we've already seen in the slideshow, where these sort of Kelly-esque, dare I say, shapes sort of are then placed within these environments. And you can imagine him sort of envisioning, um, you know, how his shapes might uh, sort of live in, in the real world um, via this sort of artificial world of the postcard. And of course, you know, to speak to the male, I think, you know, we've talked about the wall and the floor. These are very physical sites um, in which uh, Kelly is addressing very specifically. He's not accepting them as neutral spaces. And I don't think he understood uh, the male system as neutral either. And of course, one of his friends was Ray Johnson. So he would have been familiar with the idea of male art, even if uh, the sort of specifics of it were probably not to his own personal taste. Nonetheless, he, like Johnson, used uh, the postcard format and the mail system as a way to, uh, you know, sort of he activated relationships with these sort of miniaturized works. And so by not exhibiting them and not selling them, they nonetheless form a sort of, uh, you know, economy that ranges from that of the gift to that of these sort of personal, we could say inside jokes or inside sort of um, provocations as when he sends, uh, you know, some of them to a lover uh, versus a, a curator. And so again, there's different levels and we might understand that some of those levels um, in the way that the wall and the floor dictate certain forms, perhaps the recipient also dictates certain forms which is not necessarily, I mean, I think in some cases, it seems that uh, Kelly imagined uh, or rather created a work with a particular recipient in mind. And then in other uh, cases, uh, it appears that he was constantly making these. So there are works with a specific recipient in mind. And I think there's also works uh, that were just sort of made. And there's also a sense in which these are sort of exercises, like there are ways in which while traveling um, or maybe even just having a quick idea, uh, he could work fast. And so in that sense, they also have the status perhaps of sketches. Um, so in a sense, uh, a lot is encompassed within this body of work from the sort of more formal to the sort of more off the cuff. And I think he certainly saw this sort of fixed format of the postcard as yet another uh, sort of found uh, support uh, that he could manipulate in his uh, particular way, not unlike uh, the wall or the floor. And of course, all these things sort of relate to one another and, and bleed uh, across one another. And um, so I think a way that we can then use this uh, sort of coda to then also open up these other exhibitions is I think we can now use this as a way into speaking about how Kelly looked at the world and how he engaged with the world and how uh, sort of source material 
uh, found its way into paintings and sculptures, as well as in these sort of um, quicker and more sort of um, less sort of, let's say formalized in some cases, um, uh, works of male art. Um, Alex, any, can, yeah. can I correct yeah. you on, on, one, on uh, one, one thing, especially with regard to how, how Kelly saw the word, he was kind of worried um, that people would perceive his photographs as source for his work. And uh, he always told it come, they come after. He, he sees something in the world, it made him think of something he already did. That's, that's, was, that's what he wanted to, he emphasized it to me many, many times. Um, so it's not true to say that all the, the shapes came from the, from outside, from the outside world. Sometimes it was just a script. The outside world would be him scribbling something, not thinking and, oh, what did I do? Uh, so it's not completely true that it's just always from the world outside. Uh, the, other, the other thing is that with regard to the postcard, he didn't do them constantly, it was by spurts. He made quite a few at the beginning, and they were, at the beginning it was to send to friends, really. And then at some point, he had started to, to, to there is one particular poster I'm thinking about, uh, postcard I'm thinking about where he was going to send to a friend, and he said, no, no, it's, I, I want to understand, I like it very much, and I want to understand why I like it, so I'll keep it. Um, so then he, that, you know, so that was around the 60, in the sixties and then he, he had some you know, decades in which he made none really. And, uh, so we, we don't have the full corpus because we don't know <laughs> all the ones that he sent have not, um, not necessarily been, you know, brought back uh, from, uh, from the world, but uh, it, it was, all, it was with regard to, oh, it's too good. I want to understand what's, what's. What moves me in this, it's something that he also had about his works. In fact, they are, from very early on, there's a, there's a re, um, book whose, whose name, I don't forget, it was a kind of, a kind of gay British aristocrat that came to New York and was friendly with all the current sleep, sleep group. And he has his portrait of elsewhere. So he doesn't want to sell his work. <laughs> and one day I, you know, I asked him, well, why don't you like to sell your work? Because I, would, I like to see them. I want to, <laughs> I have two because, you know, that's where artists live, but I want to see, my, I want to see them. I feel bereft when they, when they leave my studio. And so, and I think that many of the postcards probably that he kept probably were, you know, uh, where, although he, he had a, he had different categories. It was the A, the, the A postcard, the B postcard and the C postcard, but, uh, <laughs> But I think a lot of the A's that might have been things that he wanted to send to, he had at first thought to send to friends and said, no, no, I'll keep it. I'll, I'll send another one. <laughs> Do we have any ideas um, why this uh, body of work was so on and off and why there are moments in which he produced a lot and then other times in which, uh, you know, years would go by with supposedly, as far as we know, at the moment, uh, no production. Yeah, I've, I've not, not figured out. But, um. I'm I'm quite intrigued because I'm not exactly sure that all of them are about how Ellsworth Kelly sees the world so much as how he hides the world. Mm. They reminded me very much of the fact that he served in the camouflage division uh, during World War II, and that that. The, there's there is a bit of a relationship with 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 camouflage and i'm particularly thinking of gertrude stein uh turning to picasso um seeing camouflaged um tanks and saying to picasso you invented this and she meant you invented cubism which is like camouflage and I think it goes true. It goes to also some of the subtexts because there are a lot of sort of peekaboo images of men, and then there's some very whimsical visions of women, including the the haunches of a beautiful model superimposed on the Statue of Liberty. So there's there's a certain kind of sexual teasing going on in here. In terms of the men, it's that uh, Ellsworth never hid the fact that he was gay. But he didn't broadcast it either. And so this was a place where it's almost if you're looking through his eyes at a world where there's always a beautiful man right now, uh, looking back at you, or hopefully you will find one. Um, but the ones with women are not in the least misogynistic, and uh, they're very, very funny. And I think Ellsworth's visual wit goes hand in hand with his social poise and his social wit. And they come out in the postcards very strongly. That one's wonderful.
anyone want to take uh, this idea of the approach to shape and form to uh, the paintings and sculpture and this, you know, how this relationship, which I think is a very important point to clarify the way in which he saw the world and how that did in, you know, did or did not inform the particular shapes um, that he used in his work. Well, you would see something that that really you, you found fascinating, but uh, it, it, it happened a few times where he told me that, you know, he, he had, there was this roof that really he took, every time he passed it by, he, and one day he had to take a photo of the roof, and he said, but I can't do it in painting. I, I just don't know, I, I wouldn't be able to do it. It's no, it's too good in, you know, it's like, I can't I can't achieve the same effect. So we, it was the kind of thing that he would, he would say. So. It was, it was not a theoretical reason, as Rob said, he was an empiricist with no theory. That's absolutely true. So it was not for theoretical reasons that he, 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 he kept the, the two, he wanted to make sure that people don't, don't think that he's basically copying something just like that, uh, copying his photograph in particular. But it, it, was, it was, I can't, I, will be, I won't be able to render, to, to do it. So I have, to, I have to find a way to put it in my work, but, not as an exact condition. That was a, that's very different from the early transfers that he made in France, which are exact, you know, exact rendering of, of some things which are already flat in the world. That's which which is a system that he more or less abandoned when he came to America. Not completely, but almost. But um, <clears throat> anyway, it's I mean, I have driven with him in a car, and he would just say, "Oh, did you see that? <laughs> that's like my." Uh, it's like my my relief for the you know, whatever. <laughs> so you would you would branch this way. Well, I think this is perhaps a great place for us <clears throat> to sort of end our conversation and open the conversation up to the chat room and anyone who's submitted questions. Okay, so um, our first question is from our friend GE, which I will be reading on his behalf since he's in the library right now. Um, he asked, can we make an argument that Ellsworth, Ellsworth, I'm sorry, Ellsworth Kelly's achievement as an artist, perhaps his prime achievement rests less on rests less than on themes and ideas than on his farms, bringing them into our modern consciousness. I don't know. I frankly don't think that Ellsworth had themes. <laughs> so I would start there. And I don't think he had ideas per se either, although he was a very intelligent man. Uh, and as to the themes, he, he, he registered everything that was human, but he didn't express it in his art. He set up circumstances whereby one could experience things. Um, I'm sorry, that's my phone. I'm going to turn it off. I keep trying to turn it off and it doesn't want to go off. Um, so I think, I, I think Ellsworth is a great emancipator. He frees us from pre-existing uh, pre ideas and he frees us from uh, teleologies. You don't have to sign on to anything to look at his work, but if you look at it, the more you look at it, the more there is to see. And I think the key element is the instability of that work for the reasons that I was trying to get at before. The, the asymmetries that are built in are the ways in which a sequence of colors does not break down into a, uh, an actual sequence as you might find it uh, in prismatic terms or a pairing of this color with that color or whatever. It, it, he he, he fine-tuned things that could coexist, but that didn't lock in. And the fact that they don't lock in means that we have to keep going back to look at them to verify the pleasure that we have had seeing them the first time. Okay. Thank you for that wonderful answer and question from GE. Our next question is from Amanda and um, you should be able to unmute to ask. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for the conversation. Um, my question had to do with if you could speak a little bit more about Kelly's relationship with Matisse's work, um, particularly how it pertains to cutouts and the Blanton Museum Chapel and the Saint-Paul-de-Vence Chapel. Thank you. 
Well, <laughs> this was a, a kind of negative obsession of Ellsworth. He always wanted to say, no, 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 Matisse was far less important to me than Picasso. And, it, <clears throat> and when you look at his letters and, and all this kind of thing, yes, it's true that he, he far less often referenced Matisse than, than uh, Picasso. And uh, with regard to the Vence Chapel, he was in, in uh, Saint Paul de Vence just after this had been inaugurated and he was spending uh, Christmas with um, uh, Amy Mag and he didn't go. So that he was like very, very, maybe it was a fear of you know, anxiety of influence, but he didn't go to see the Vence Chapel at that time. He went, to, I don't know, 20 or 30 years later. Um, he had a very in strong interest in one particular cutout, Zulma, big, big cutout of Matisse, but he, we, he constantly tried to, 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 you know, to deflect the, the, the role of Matisse, that Matisse had with his, uh, with his, uh, in his formation, as opposed to Picasso. That was partly because so, so many people were making the comparison, so he felt, oh, I have to tame that down, I, I think. I mean, I, I, I think I think his I think what you know, this is perfectly true, and I think his his skittishness about Matisse was well founded because in a world where people didn't have a very broad visual culture, Matisse was the was the person they went to immediately, and he had to sort of prove that he was not Matisse's illegitimate son, uh, but but in fact, obviously, he got a lot from Matisse who wouldn't. There was a there was a, an interesting uh, show made by Eric de Chassé and uh, Rémi Labrusse on on, uh, on a comparison of, of of Matisse and Elsa's plan drawing. Yeah. And it was actually fascinating because there was a big difference <coughs> between the two, a minute one, but it was very big in fact, that all the shapes of Matisse are open. This, well, all the shapes of uh, Elsa's Kelly were closed. Like yeah. you never had this kind of like escape of the white. And you know, it was absolutely stunning uh, to- well, That's to... a very good point because I think that's, in his case, uh, the form is bounded energy, it may be, uh, chrome energy, or it may be dynamic, you know, design energy can be all, it's always sort of locked in. And yeah. you're right, in Matisse, it's fluid all the time. And in, and in, in, in Picasso, it's more sort of agonizingly breaking itself up in front of you, so. Well, you just have to look at the sculptures. I mean, Matisse's sculptures and, and Kelly's sculptures, they're two different no, well, that's true, but that, but 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 there are, but you you could legitimately compare Kelly's uh, cutout and and um, when they, when there are some and Matisse cut Matisse cutouts. That's also you know when you look to when you actually look at the real cutouts, they are not one shape. Very rarely, they are like many little things put together. Of course, you have the silhouette, and that's that's. But they are not conceived the same way in one in one scoop. I mean, there are yeah, there are these films of Matisse making making uh, you know. Um, plant shapes with, with his scissors continuously. But in fact, it was not the problem for him. Well, with Ellsworth, it would have been completely, you know, just one gesture, that's it. Absolutely. Um, thank you all for that. Our next question is from Tom McGlynn and you should be able to unmute now. Yay. Uh, thanks everyone for this excellent discussion. Um, I had a question about uh, Ellsworth Kelly's relationship to Pop, not to pigeonhole him in terms of being in relation to anything, but <laughs> this idea of P Peter Plagan's term of imageless Pop, I, I thought about Ellsworth Kelly's, Ellsworth Kelly's relation to, you know, like those postcards and, you know, stories of him chasing like a woman off the bus to see the pattern on her scarf to kind of try to remember it. This kind of that, this idea of the instantiation of the real in his work, you know, like it, th that the gestalt is an instantiation of the real, and somehow that's related to aspects of pop art. Well, he, he was persuaded that he had invented pop, so uh, <laughs> but he was, you know, and one of the artists he liked the most was uh, Roy Lichtenstein, so you know, he was very much interested in, in pop art, that's for sure. But the idea that he he, he, said, he he said that with some kind of some kind of you know wink, but nevertheless he said that several times to me that he invented pop. He must have said that to, to you, uh, Rob, as well, no? And he didn't say exactly that, but I know that he had those feelings. And if I'm not mistaken, the blue piece that was shown at, at 420 at Leo's, the next room was a room of Roy's paintings, so that it was like there was a dialogue all the time between him and his pop peers, but he was not doing pop. 
And I think the reason that it's done that way is that his color was bold and flat. Well, the point is that Ellsworth's color was always mixed. It was always incredibly subtle. He never used out of the can colors. Uh, he didn't use including cans. black, including oh. black. Yeah, including the black. No, including the black. And that's another thing. The surface as a an active thing disappears relatively early on in his work. And thereafter, it is a matter of layers and layers of relatively thin pigment until it sort of locks in. And that sets him apart from all those people who were coming out of gestural painting or people like Bob Raman, who didn't do gestural painting, but did surface painting very actively. So his, his uh, flatness was rich, it was dense, and it was like a breath of fresh air because <laughs> nothing distracted your eye from what you were seeing directly in terms of surface activity that connoted emotion or the presence of the artist or whatever. Right, and his minimalism is kind of rhetorically free too. It's, it seems to be in the real rather than making a point about you know, physical ness or, you know, object ness. It just seems to be, like you said, Rob, very egalitarian. And I think that's true of the other quote unquote minimalists. I mean, most of them didn't like the term and for very good reasons. I can't think of a good minimalist artist who was making a point of uh, minimal, right? And what I tried once to do was to say, let's turn this around. In the case of Bob Raman's work, it's not minimal. It's not the reduction of something complicated. It is the sufficiency of something simple. Well, he also felt that he invented minimalism. Well, the ism is the problem. <laughs> well, thank you. Now, Ellsworth was not modest. And so when he was driving around the car with you, I uh, said, that looks like something I painted. That's because he was always thinking about something that he had done. And that's fine. I remember, I remember visiting the extraordinary, beautiful show of Van Gogh portraits at the Boston Museum of Art with him. And um, he said, he, do you see this combination of two colors? Like, and yeah, that makes me think of this painting. I mean, and did you see this, this blue triangle there? This is, and so after a while, I said, also, I'm sure that Van Gogh did not copy you. <laughs> 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 but it was his remark, he like, painting after painting was very funny. <laughs> I remember this moment. There wasn't the least bombast in it. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> our next uh, comment um, is from Terry. And um, Terry, um, give me one second. You should be able to unmute. Great. Thank you. Um, well, Chloe and the great rail team called me out for the comment I just put in the chat. So it asked me to speak. So. Um, I really appreciate the, the ways in which the conversation about Ellsworth, you know, the man, the artist relating to this, these great um, sort of mini lessons in these moments in his work made me think of what, what I think strikes me about his work is related to how I know him as a person by way of students. And a few times in my educating career, I've had students had the experience of suddenly this man comes there looking at it else with Kelly and this man comes up and starts talking to them. And of course, each time the student knew it was Ellsworth Kelly. And the last one was at SAIC with the Griffin Court um, outdoor piece that it changed the student's life because Ellsworth was clearly um, taken with that student and sort of what I always think of as the next viewing and his work is really for me at the top of the list of painters where it sets up the terms of the next viewing. So, you know, that that really is where the meaning comes in the next viewing. And, and what I'm learning from this conversation is that was also his thing, his next viewing, even of his own work. And then finally, just adding to my comment, since, since I posted it years ago when the Art Institute honored him with their, the big honor award they give every year, with the dinner, um, James Kuno was uh, interviewing him in the Ryerson Auditorium, which is the massive auditorium in the back of the museum. And when someone like that comes, the students are always herded up into the balcony, you know, but at least, as I always said to them, at least you get to go, you know, at least you get to go. And Kuno is pointing to people in the ground, the main floor for questions. And they're just these dusty, dusty old questions. And Ellsworth literally is like falling asleep on the stage. And all of a sudden some kid 
because I never found out who it was. And because I went up and I always go up in the, I would always go up with the students in the balcony in solidarity. This kid yells out, What's your favorite color? And it just resounded through the whole, and Ellsworth just lit up. And then we got like 10 minutes of Ellsworth on fire. Brilliant. And I saw Kudo as we we're walking out, and I'm like, you know, that kid just saved your event, you know, because he brought the energy. And it just reminded me in the, today's conversation, which I appreciate so much, that that energy is there in the work, but it was clearly there in the man. Thank you for that, Terry. Um, I don't know. You're if welcome. Are... That was Siri. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 so um I, you want to know. I was gonna say that was not my voice <laughs> you're welcome <laughs> um we have one final question from darla um and she give me one second and she'll be able to unmute okay darla you can ask hi um i don't think my camera is working but the question has to do, it's really just a general question about the claim that there's no ideology present. So I'm just wondering about the decision to use some colors over others, right? So some colors will be more likely, I think, to show up based on what's been available to the eye. And I'm just curious to think more with you or have here comments on what might constitute an idea about the choice of color distinctive perhaps from something like a political ideology, but an idea about color that's active in having to make a decision about whether one uses this color or that set of colors over another. Thank you. Hmm. <clears throat> well, I, I don't think that, um, as you said, the preconceived ideas about color, except that he said uh, and and often i i often discuss with him because i could not exactly understand his point he said that he preferred the european relationship to color which is and he insisted that european and he had he had leger in mind as a main example prefer to use uh spectral colors and it is true that he didn't use very often non-spectral colors let's say uh, brown or pink uh, himself but that was um you know, that was only for reason of um, saturation and intensity that he preferred uh, spectral colors, I think. And you see, that's what he, I'm not, and his idea that American, was that American painters don't, don't use them that much, I don't, I don't even know if it's true, but he, but he was persuaded of that. But he didn't have any color theory, for example. In fact, there's this, there's this encounter that he, he says about, um, meeting Albers in an elevator and uh, of, to go to Betty Parsons' uh, gallery and uh, coming down from a show and, and Albers uh, apparently asked Alsos, well, that's what the way Alsos remembered, what's your color theory? And Alsos responded, I don't have any. And Albers would have said that shows. I think that from the, from the part of Albers, that was a compliment because Al Albers did not have a theory himself. In fact, he attacked all theories of colors. Um, he had, an interest in effects of colors, not of theory. So I'm not sure that in Elsus's mind, choosing one color over the next is would be part of a, some kind of um, ideological program. I, I frankly uh, would be very would be very hard for me to to pin them down, but pin them down. But... <clears throat> I don't know, maybe... there, there, there was a time in the 20s when color theories or what seemed to be color theories abounded, and there were lots of Bauhaus. Uh, yeah. Russian constructors and so on and so forth, and they thought they were getting at the primary mm -hmm. colors and the basic structural um, vocabulary of art, visual forms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that wore off pretty soon. <laughs> so people began to realize it was still possible to, and Ellsworth is always looking at things in nature. So if there's a color in there that resembles something you find in nature, it's because it resembles something you find in nature. And there's some aubergines and there's some sort of uh, mm. all, all different kinds of oranges that you would not find in any color chart, you know, normally, but that he saw and then would mix up and then he could, you know, find things to do with them. And I think that was a, a measure of his freedom. He just did not let himself uh, be sort of wrapped into somebody else's theory or in his own. Which is why he's useful to younger artists. Um, 
Um, thank you all for those wonderful answers and everybody who asked a question. Um, at the rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading. And today I'm thrilled to welcome our poet of the day, Barrett White. Um, Barrett White edits online journal, an, an online journal called Tagwork. His poetry has appeared or are, is forthcoming in the Brooklyn Rail Diagram, non, no materialism, PQB, elsewhere. Um, you have it. Hi, can you hear me? Can you see me? Yeah, see you. Yep. Great. Um, thank you, Raven, and thanks to the Brooklyn Rail for inviting me to be a part of this program. And thank you to each of the speakers for their compelling presentations and the overall conversation on the work of Ellsworth Kelly. Uh, I thought it would be appropriate to read some Ekphrasis poems. So I have three poems to share with you this afternoon. Um, what do you need to know? The titles of the poems are shared with the exhibitions on which they are based. And I've provided links to online documentation uh, for each in the Zoom chat, if you'd like to check them out. Uh, I should also note that only one of these exhibitions was seen actually in person. Uh, the other poems are composed solely after online documentation and lots of floor and ground uh, work. So that seems to be uh, uh, copacetic. So the first poem is uh, inspired by a solo exhibition by the artist Soil Thornton uh, that was held at Essex Street in New York. And the title is Sustenance Traversing Foundational Urgencies, STFU Some Refo Outing. Hallway, Stairway, descent, cluster toss, kinderbox emptied on floor. It was sprinkling outside, damp, damp inside, sprinkling sculpture by length of chain and parceled scrape from where chain links sidewalk scribble. Gutter text, cardboard scrawl, macro, macro, I'm baby. 55 inch LED TV, TV LED, TV DEL, daddy, mommy, life's good, best as is. Spindling, accumulation, curves, nerves, lasso, plastic, thread of binding, a different form of chain, coil snakes, assay, compound labels, the pattern of names carved into gourds, little sleeping arrayed by cords splayed underneath, tucked away in crawl space, cubbied, giant pastel crocs in place for the, th for the three-legged race. Uh, my next poem uh, is titled Feast of Hunger after a three-person exhibition at Spazio or Brescia, Italy with work by Julia Cinci, June Crespo, and Michael E. Smith. And the piece is in three parts. One. Splayed across the wall, a trailing twining spire of vomitous slant gnarls a metal shepherd's staff, mutated core sample of the infected device, writhing with Tetsuo extensions that weft warm gray flesh, a spent fire pit murmuring. The warped conduit clamp bends toward waxing light, smeared with melted rubber, dusted with ash, a dousing rod for artifacted collapse. Veined crutch and flotsam, there is an anemone movement to its filigree. Two, a sole survivor from the annihilation of humanity sits on the floor. Quote, and I came all this way crawling. Have you seen the movie Cube 2 Hypercube? There are these spinning geometric forces of light, biblically accurate angels maybe, that slice and tear people apart almost surgically. That's what it was like. That's what happened to me. Somewhere along the line, passing through dimensions, I got fused with another torso, a botched human centipede. I couldn't believe it either. And all I got was this t-shirt. Have you seen the movie 13 Ghosts starring Tony Shalhoub? In the movie, a mansion is used as a giant device to summon some unruly spirits. It's all necromancy. One of the spirits is the torso, legless, decapitated, wrapped in plastic. It crawls along the floor and frightens the young son, played by child actor Alec Roberts, but other than that, seems practically harmless. I know, I'm a delicate ceramic, prone to flaking and mindful of my displaced chakras, an unraveled cord, the shell of a hungry ghost. Anyway, how am I talking? Does this hollow voice at least sound like it was once partially full? Three. 
A porcupine fish flies out of the hole in the back of your head. It pastes itself to the wall, prone and oblong, facing upward in plasticine apogee. Mary Magdalene in ecstasy, a pair of pliers dangle from its tail fin, tinkers bite to fill a godlike void with malevolent machination, an unholy truck stop toe ring. And my last poem is uh, based on an uh, installation by the artist Yin Li um, that was exhibited at the Great Salt Lake in Utah uh, with the curatorial project Final Hot Desert, which focuses on offsite installations. And the title uh, is Portal. Recall soil to amend terraformed metamorphosis into terraces on lakes flipped back from its demand for the opening aerial vehicle replicant shatter, scales the carcass of an octopus stranded at the turbidity slough and sinking in its own phosphorescence, churning mounds of salt in search of fuel deposits, suspensionless on seismic plates whose disruption can be seen silhouetted through the flow of lights aboard distant recovery vehicles, smelting fire with nematocysts disappear amidst sister oil storms, the aircraft collapsed in glass slouched horizons strewn with nets, cords of hydrocarbons, neurotoxins, swaying towers, the relics of fiber optics, some airframe surfaces bloomed indigo brightly enough for observers to remark on the solar illumination navigational map breaking through its cloudy pneumatophore. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barrett. Um, and thank you, Phyllis, Eve, Robert, Alex. We also like to thank everyone from Matthew Marks for helping make today's event possible. Over the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has brought together art, music, dance, film, theater, literature, and thoughtful social and political mediations in our monthly publication and in our public events, like here in our daily NSC. Please check the chat for a link to donate to support our writers, editors, and operations here at the Rail. Join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for our 91st poetry reading with Mona Kareen, Marini Arsanos, and Sarah Alcamel. You can now turn on your microphone and say goodbye as you leave. Okay. Goodbye. Thanks so much. Thank you, presenter. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Thank so. Thank you everyone. Yeah. That was excellent. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you Rob. Robert. Goodbye, Fong. Thank you Thank all. you, thank you, Valand. Thank oh, you. Hi, Mark. Hey, <laughs> take care. I was in the meeting, so I didn't hear, but I can't wait to re-listen it later. Thank oh you for this. All right, Fawn. Take care. Bye. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye. Take thank care. You. Enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everyone. everyone. Thank you. Go see the shows. Go see the show. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the reading also. Bye. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye.